thumbs down. This one is more of a thumbs up, but still a thumbs down. Thumbs up, thumbs down, kind of in the middle there. All right, this is what you would call a vegan burger, okay? Except it has cheese, so it's kind of like a vegetarian burger, I guess. You got it on the, on the tortilla because of carbs. You want to cut out carbs and stuff like that. It has the actual hamburger on it, and it has cheese and ketchup. Uh, is that a hamburger, yes or no? No, not a hamburger. Okay, we'll go not a hamburger. All right, then the last one. We have a potato. Is this a hamburger, yes or no? No, we are 100% in agreement that this is, not, this is not a hamburger, except for one person in the back. This is not a hamburger. This is a potato, okay? We know it's not a hamburger. All right, so a little gimmick illustration here, just something silly. <sighs> Hamburgers, I, I would argue with you and say that while these may not all be great hamburgers, these four are still considered in the hamburger category, right? While we may not want to eat a McDouble, when we imagine a hamburger, we imagine a big juicy hamburger with tomato and lettuce and ketchup and real big and real thick, half pound. That's how we imagine a hamburger. But what I'd argue and say is this is a hamburger, this is a hamburger, this is a hamburger, and this is, even though there are different flavors, different styles, different types of hamburgers. They're all still hamburgers. But this is clearly not a hamburger, and we understand that. We look at it, and we're like, no, that's not a hamburger. That's wrong. That's, that's a potato. When it comes to the Christian faith, uh, there, there's ideas, and there's things, and we could say these are Christian ideas, and even though they're different, and sometimes there's different ideas, and we're like, we may not agree with those ideas. It's still a Christian idea. But there becomes a point with certain things that it quits being a Christian idea. Like when this quits being a hamburger, we clearly know that this is a hamburger. Let me give you an illustration. When it comes to worship, right? There's different ways that people worship. Some people worship uh, plain, plain Jane, which is okay. They like hymns and stuff like that, which is nothing wrong with that. Kind of plain, like this hamburger over here, just with the cheese on it. Uh, it, it's plain, and, and that's okay. Some people, they like to raise their hands, and they like to sing, and they like to really belt it out. And it's a little bit different like that. And then some people, they really get all in, and they start dancing, and they run up and down the aisles, and that's still worship, right? It's like that. It's, it's really re weird. It's really different, but it still is what it is. It's still worship. But if someone says, I worship God by killing cats, we'd be like, no, that's not worship. That, that's outside of the realm of Christian idea. That, that's not worship. Or when it comes to theology, right? Some people believe uh, that it, when you become a Christian, that you'll always be a Christian. That's once saved, always saved. Okay, that, that's fine. Some people believe that you can lose your salvation. That, that's fine too. Those are both Christian ideas. I have a clear stance on that, and, and I believe a certain thing about it, but someone else can believe the opposite of me and still follow Jesus and still be a Christian, and it's still a Christian idea. But if someone says that Jesus never died for your sins... It's like a potato. It's totally outside of the realm of Christianity. Totally different. It's not something that we can agree on. It's still be a Christian idea. I say all this, and I want to give a little preface here, that I'm not trying to attack anybody when I'm about to say what I'm about to say. I'm not trying to attack anybody. I'm not trying to say that I'm better than anybody. Uh, I'm not trying to say that I have it all right and the people I'm talking about have it all wrong. But there becomes a point when some people say stuff, that it moves from the realm of a Christian idea to a not-Christian idea. And so I'm going to talk about something that happened last Sunday. We had a speaker come, and uh, his name was Keith Barkley, and he's a great guy. He's a good guy. Um, I, I haven't really talked to him. I actually, the first time I met him was last Sunday. I tried having a conversation with him, but he was so busy getting stuff ready that we really didn't have time to talk, and, and that's okay. He's a good guy. I'm sure he loves Jesus. But he started teaching some things that moved out of the realm of things that were Christian ideas to the realm to things that weren't Christian ideas. He was teaching things that at one point, you know, maybe it's like a hamburger, but then it became like a potato. And there was thoughts and there was ideas that aren't necessarily reflective of this church and isn't necessarily reflective of the Bible. And it's more than just a difference of opinion. It's a difference of a Christian idea and a not Christian idea. And so I wanted to bring that up. Like I said, I'm not here to attack him, and I'm not here to say anything negative about him, but I'm here to attack the idea. And the main idea and the main negative thing that I seen from him was the prosperity gospel. And here's what the prosperity gospel is. The prosperity gospel says that God's aim is to make all believers healthy and wealthy. If you have enough faith or if you believe something deep enough, then God has to give you what you believe. And that's not a Christian idea. That's not true. That's nowhere in the Bible. That's wrong. That's not a Christian idea. It's, it's like saying a potato is a hamburger. It's a totally different idea. God doesn't have to give you what you want. That's not Christian. While God does want to give you what you want, he doesn't have to give you what you want. 
okay? He's not an ATM. You can't press buttons and he has to listen to you. You can't obey him a certain way and then he has to give you what you're asking for. The problem is, is that a lot of people believe this in the church today. Uh, 50, about 50% of Americans believe that God gives material wealth to those who have enough faith. In Nigeria, 96%. In India, 90, 82% believe that same thing. And this is a new idea that a lot of people have been teaching that, that God has to give you what you believe for. If you have enough faith, then God has to give it to you. And that's just, that's not true. That's not what Christianity is about. That's not what the Bible is about. Following Jesus doesn't mean that God has to give you what you want. Following Jesus means that you realize that he is enough no matter what's going on in your life. Whatever situation you have or whatever struggle or whatever problem, following Jesus means that you say God is enough no matter what is going on. Some people believe that the church has been built on the back of the wealthy. But honestly, the church has been built on the blood of the poor. Like the reason that we have churches today is because people were killed over, over what they believed. And they, they trusted Jesus so much that, that God didn't change the situation, but use them to produce what we have today. You think of every single disciple uh, or apostle of Jesus, all 12 of them, or 11 out of 12 of them, died a murderous death. They were killed because of what they believed. And the only one who didn't was attempted to be murdered. They put him in a, bot, a pot of boiling oil and tried to burn him alive, but God protected him through it. If those guys who were so close to Jesus and were around Jesus the, their whole life, if they didn't have enough faith to stop that bad stuff from happening, like I think of myself, like how could I have enough faith to stop that from happening if, if we get stuff from God by how much faith we have or do not have the problem is, is that the Bible is meant to be read in context, and Keith Barkley kind of took it out of its context. As my preaching teacher used to say, a text without a pretext, or a text without a context is a pretext to heresy. And basically what that means, if you don't read the Bible in its context, then you can make it say whatever you want it, whatever you want it to say. And so the prosperity gospel is so damaging because of this. Here's what happens. People hear the prosperity gospel and they believe it. And they're like, if I believe hard enough, then God's going to do this situation. God's going to heal this person or God's going to make everything okay. And they, they believe that in their heart and they believe it. And then they, they start praying like, God, fix my marriage. God, heal this person. God, pay my house off because I'm going out of debt. But what happens is that doesn't happen. The marriage doesn't get fixed. The person who they're asking for healing for maybe dies or they have to sell their house because they don't have enough money. And then they end up not believing in God. But the problem is they're not really not believing in God. They're not believing in a false God, a God that's not true, a God that, that doesn't make real promises. And so they end up walking away from the church, not because they don't believe in the God of the Bible, but because they believe a God that someone made up for them. And so the prosperity gospel is so damaging because it pushes people away from the church. When you pray really hard and you believe really deeply that someone's going to get healed and then they don't. Or you pray really hard and deeply that God's going to fix something in your life and then he doesn't. God never promises he's going to make every situation great. He promises that he'll be with you through every situation. But he doesn't promise that he's going to fix every situation. And so like I said, I just wanted to bring that up. I was talking to Steve about it. And we felt like it was our responsibility to address those situations, some of the things that were said last week. And it's not that he's a bad guy, and it's not that he can't sing or doesn't do great things for Jesus. It's just that he moved out of the realm from, from Christianity to ideas that were non-Christian. And uh, Jesus doesn't need your money. Jesus doesn't need you to do what he's going to do. He doesn't need your money. Uh, and so that kind of threw me off too, just a little bit. I just want to make sure you understand that Jesus doesn't want to have a relationship with you so he can use your money to buy things and get new things. And yeah, so I just wanted to address that real quick. Uh, one last thing on it. He had one illustration where he talked about a van and that he needed a new van and that he believed God was going to buy it for him, which is great. It's fine to believe that. But he said he claimed it in the name of Jesus and now he has a picture of it on his phone and, and it's his. God's going to give it to him. And that's just not how God works. Okay. God does want you to believe deeply, and he does want you to have faith. He, I, I love how one preacher puts it. He says, I believe God can do something. I believe God will do something. But if he doesn't do something, he's still God, and I'm not going to leave him. Okay? And so that's the type of faith we need to have. When we know someone who is hurting because they're broken, we know so, or we need a, some sort of money, we need someone healed, that's how we pray. We say, God, I, I believe you can do it because you're God. And I know that you can do this, but even if you don't, I love you anyway. And that, that's, where, that's what real faith is. I think real faith is not about believing God's going to do something, but believe God is still with you no matter what the situation is. Amen. Amen. Yep. So I just wanted to bring that up real quick. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into our text for today. If you have any questions or any thoughts about that, 
uh, come and see me after church. I'd love to talk to you about it. I wanted to bring up the actual text. I believe it's Mark 11 that was preached out of, but I don't have time if I wanted to cover 1 John today. And so if you have any questions or thoughts about that, I'd love to talk to you about it. I'd have no problem with that, all right? Let's pray. Let's refocus in, and we'll jump into 1 John. Lord, we thank you that none of us have it all together, and none of us are perfect. and We all do things that we shouldn't. But despite that, you love us and you care about us and you give us Jesus. I thank you that you walk with us no matter the situation. No matter what struggle, no matter the problem, no matter what's the matter in our life, you're with us. And we thank you for that. I pray that we feel that presence. Even even when it's hard to feel that presence. Even when things look bad, we pray for that. We just thank you for Jesus who loves us and serves us and cares for us despite of us. We thank you for your Bible and your word. Pray that we be a people that read it in context and uh, don't take things out of context. That we read it as a story of your salvation and and your love and and your grace towards us. That we read it as a story of you revealing yourself to us. We thank you for Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you've got your Bibles, we'll be in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. We've been working through 1 John. Uh, We got, I think, maybe like six six sermons left in it. It'll get us uh, almost to Christmas, I believe. We've loved going through it. I love reading, uh, going through books and preaching books because it helps me, forces me to talk about things that I wouldn't normally talk about. And so when I'm going through a book, uh, it forces me to talk about those things. And so I love it. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because he shall see him or we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Anyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away the sins, the sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known, knows him. Little children, do uh, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. But this is uh, evident who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And so I read this text. And a lot of times when I read a text, I get kind of confused for the first time, especially if I haven't read it for a while and I got to read through it a couple times. But I didn't have to for this text. Uh, You don't have to know a lot to understand it. You don't have to have a PhD in theology. Uh, It's actually kind of quite simple. And so the main idea is, is this, is that there are people who are family to God. Twelve times in these ten verses, there was words used that described family. Six times it said the word children. Four times it said the word born. One time it said the word father. And one time it said the word brother. And so the overarching idea is that there's people who are family of God. And even, even narrower of a main idea is that there are people who are children of God. And so he talks about being a child, child of God. Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about two things when it comes to being a child of God. I'm going to talk about the plan of being a child of God. And I'm going to talk, talk about the proof of being a child of God. I typically don't do sermons like that. Usually what I'll do is I'll read a verse, I'll talk about it. Uh, but I actually had three points originally, and they all started with P, and I was really proud of myself. Uh, I had the plan, the perks, and the proof of God by shortening it down because of what I talked about at, at the beginning. I figured my Bible school teachers would be real proud of me. Even I never do stuff like that. But so we have the plan of God, or the plan uh, to be a child of God, and the proof that you are a child of God. And so the plan to become a child of God, I'm going to read something real quick out of John. John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. This is different than the book of 1 John, but it's still written by the same guy. Still written by the same guy, probably about 40, 50 years earlier. And so he says this in John chapter 1, verse 10, or verse 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
And so he's talking about being a child of God here. And he says, those who become a child of God are not those who are super righteous. Those who become a child of God are not necessarily those who, uh, who were born, uh, who were created by God. But those who become a child of God are those who have faith in Jesus. Those who are born through a supernatural birth. And so you become a child of God by believing and trusting in Jesus. Not a belief here, but a belief in your heart. A belief in your heart. See, Jesus came and he did this. He lived the perfect life. You didn't do that. You lived the opposite of a perfect life. You lived a sinful life. You have struggles. You have problems. You have brokenness inside of you. You do things that you shouldn't do. You do good things for wrong reasons. You do wrong things for good reasons. And while we may do good sometimes, inside of us there is sin and there is brokenness. But Jesus was never broken. He was never sinful. He was 100% perfect. He listened to the Father at all times. And he loved God perfectly. Due to that, God put him on a cross and punished him in your place, literally pouring out his wrath upon Jesus. Like the wrath that you and I deserve, Jesus took upon himself. And then he died in our place and rose from the grave. And so those who believe that message and trust in that message, those are the ones who become children of God. Those who in their hearts say, I I follow Jesus, not those who pray a little prayer, not those who, who grew up in the church, who were born in the church. It's those who trust in Jesus and give their life to following after Jesus. Those are the ones who become born of God or, or children of God. One time I, I heard a preacher talking. Or I heard, sorry, a politician talking. And he was standing up. He's giving a heartfelt speech, and it was good. And towards the end of it, he said, put his hands out like this. He said, aren't we all children of God? And While he may, I think what he meant was right, like God created us all and so we're all made by God. But the truth is not everyone is a child of God. It's only those who have had a supernatural change inside of them. Those who have been reborn by God. Those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a child of God. It's a supernatural thing where God chooses to save you despite of you. God chooses to save you despite of what you've done. Not because you cuss or don't cuss, not because you lie or tell the truth, not because you come to church or don't come to church, but you become a child of God because God comes inside of your heart and changes who you are. That's what a child of God is. And I love what John says here in verse one again. Let let me reread that, verse one. He just gets so excited. He says in verse one, see what kind of love the father has given us that we should be called children of God and so we are. He just gets so excited. He says, think of the love, like, like the love that God has given us. That's so exciting and that's so amazing. He just gets so pumped up about it. I think about him and I think he thinks back to, to times in his life when he denied Jesus. I think he thinks back to the crucifixion. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, every single one of his disciples rejected him and ran away from him. And he thinks back to that moment. And he thinks back, God loves me despite of that. God gave me a ch- made me a child of him despite of what I did in that moment. He loves me despite of me, and he's so excited about that. And I think we, we should be the same. It's kind of like this. Uh, my wife is very pregnant. I don't know if you've seen her, but she's very pregnant. The baby is going to be born on November 19th as a plan. It's a plan C-section, right? So we're going to go in, and they're going to take the baby out. We're really excited about it. It's going to be a boy. In between now and then, i got a lot of stuff planned that I want to do. Uh, for example... I want to go to another Illini football game. I went to one yesterday, and they won by a lot. It was really exciting and fun to watch, but I want to go to another one of those. I have a Church of God training that I got to go to on Friday or that I get to go to on Friday. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I have a test that I got to take for one of my classes I'm in. Not necessarily excited about it, but I got to do that as well. Let's say my wife goes into labor before November 19th. Let's say she goes into labor the day of the Illini football game. And I'm getting ready to go to the game, and she starts to go in, in labor. What kind of husband would I be if I'm like, ah, I don't really want to go to, or I don't really want to go to your birthing. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the Illini game. Like that would be, that'd be messed up. Or if I'm taking a test and I'm in the middle of a test, and my wife calls and she's like, hey, I'm going into labor. And I'm like, oh, let me finish this test, and and then I get there. Or if I'm driving to the conference for the Churches of God, and and I'm on my way there, and she tells me she's in labor, and I keep on going. I'm like, oh, you can handle that on your own. Oh, that would be wrong. That'd be weird. Uh, that, that wouldn't be very, very right of me as a husband. What will really happen is in those moments, I'll be so filled with excitement and joy that I'll drop whatever I'm doing, no matter the situation. And I'm going to go, and I'm going to go with chastity as she births our son. I'm going to be so overwhelmed with excitement and joy to meet our new kid that I'm going to go. And I'm not saying to any of you who were maybe at work when, you were at, when your wife had a kid that that was wrong of you or something like that. I'm just saying for me, like, I'm going to be so filled with joy and excitement that when she has the baby, I'm going to drop everything I'm doing. John is saying the same thing here. 
I'm so excited. I'm so full of joy. I'm so excited that God chose me to be a child of God. It's something that is exciting. It's something that is amazing. God chose you despite of you, and he loved you despite of you, and made you a child of God despite of what you've done. And that should excite you. So what, how, how do you become a child of God, or what's the plan? You give your life to Jesus, and you trust in, in Jesus. Uh, my second thing I want to answer is this. What is the proof that you're a child of God? What's the proof look like that you are a child of God? Whoops. Uh, the proof is this. Verses 4 through 10 kind of say the same thing over and over. The proof that you're a child of God is that you look like your father. The proof that you're a child of God is that you look like him, that you look like him. Austin, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, I got a picture up here, and one is of my son. So the one on the right is my son. Can you guys guess who the one on the left is? It's me, right? It was me as a baby, right? And you can definitely tell by looking at those pictures, right? Like, that's, well, you don't know which one's which, but you say they're definitely related. They look a lot alike. If you held him up next to me, you would say, hey, he looks like his father because he does look like me. Typically, sons look like their fathers. And so what John is saying here, if you are a child of God, you should look like your father. You should look like him, not physically, but spiritually. You should stop having the sin that you have in your life. You should fight against it. You should make war against it. You should, you should be changed on, on the inside because it's a supernatural, supernatural thing. This is why reading the Bible is so important in context because you could read this and it sounds almost really condemning. It's like people who are children of God do not sin. And you're like, well, I, I sin, so I must not be a child of God. But if you go back and you read the beginning of 1 John, he says people who follow Jesus know that they have sin in their life and they don't act like they're perfect. So it's not that being a child of God means you're perfect, but it means that you're changed and you're becoming more like Jesus over a period of time. You should look at yourself right now and look back to when you follow Jesus and there should be a change in your life. If there's no change in your life, if you're not looking more like Jesus, then you might not be a child of God. That brings up to this, that it's possible to have superficial faith. It's possible to have a faith that's not even a real faith, where you say, I believe in Jesus, but that belief doesn't lead to a change in your life. It's not that we're earning salvation when we change. It's that God is changing us, that we're so excited about what he's done that he changes us in, in our heart. And so the proof that you are a child of God is that you look like your father and that you've changed. I could read verses 4 through 10 again. I'd, I'd suggest that you do it on your own, though, because it's basically saying the same thing over and over. Those who are children of God, they, they turn away from their sin, and they fight against their sin. And they've been changed. They've been changed by their sin. And so let me leave you with this. I got three big takeaways real quick. Uh, the first big takeaway is this, that being a child of God... You don't, have to learn the, you don't have to earn the love or the approval of anybody else. You already have the approval of God in heaven. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what you're going through. Uh, but no matter what it is, you don't have to earn the approval of the people around you. You don't have to earn the approval of your parents. You don't have to earn the approval of your boss. You don't have to earn the approval of your husband or wife. While you should kind of you know, want, want your husband or wife to love you and you should want to do a good job at your work, if you don't get their approval, you don't have to earn it. You have God's approval, which is so much more important than any other relationship that you have. He loves you despite of you, and he cares of you despite of you. So whatever situation is going on, you don't have to earn that approval. Uh, yesterday, I was at a football game with my friend. My college roommate came down, and I was sitting next to one of the football coaches from Rantoul, the, actually the head coach. And this really awkward situation like happened where like, there was like a fight going on with him and someone else in the crowd. It was super awkward. And he was in the wrong. He was clearly in the wrong. Uh, but in, in that moment, I wanted to stand up for him, not because, not, because I, uh, not because I thought he was right, but because I wanted him to, like, I wanted to be on his good side, right? I didn't want to get on his bad side. And that hit me instantly. Like, I don't need his approval. I have the approval of God. If someone's doing something wrong, I don't have to stand up for them because I want them to like me or I want their approval. I already have God's approval, and that's way better than having the approval of man. We are children of God. The second big takeaway is this, is if there is no change in you since you started following Jesus, then you have superficial faith. So look at your life and see, have I changed? Am I different? Is there anything different about me? If not, I'd argue and say, maybe you didn't even really believe in God. Maybe you believed in a false God, like the prosperity gospel God who says, if you do what I say, then I'll give you whatever you want. Maybe you, you believe in a version of God that looks like you and acts like you, but isn't the true God of the Bible. See, salvation is a supernatural thing where God changes you. It's not just like, oh, I believe, and 
now I'm, now I'm a follower of Jesus. Something that happens inside of you. And I'm saying that salvation doesn't come through belief because it does, but it's a supernatural belief. It's a belief that Jesus is who he says he is. So if there's no change in you, then you have supernatural or you have superficial faith. And the third thing is this. John is so excited that he is a child of God. The question is, are you excited that you're a child of God? Are you excited? I, I think about doing something like communion and we're sitting there and we're like eating the bread and we're drinking the wine. Does that excite you? Like that God says, I'm going to love you despite of you. I'm going to send myself as, as, your son, or as a son. And I'm going to die for you in your place. Does that excite you to know that, that by drinking, the, this, uh, drinking this juice and, and by uh, eating the cracker, that God is saying, I love you despite of you? So are you excited to follow Jesus or is it something that you just do because, you know, it fills up your Sunday morning or is it something you do because it makes you feel a little better, uh, but it doesn't change your life? Like John is so excited. He says, I'm a child of God. And that's so, can you believe that I'm a child of God? That's the same question I have for you. Can, can you believe that you're a child of God? If you don't, then maybe you don't view sin the right way. Maybe you don't see yourself as necessarily a, a sinner. Or maybe you don't view God the right way as someone who's super holy and amazing that we don't deserve to have a relationship with him, but he still gives it to us despite of us. And so are you excited to follow Jesus? Three takeaways where you don't have to earn anybody's love because you got God's. Uh, if there's no change in you, then you might have superficial faith. And then are you excited that you're a child of God? Uh, I'm going to pray for us. And then I have a couple quick announcements, and then we'll be free to go. So let me pray one more time for us. Lord, I thank you that prayer is not a transition from one situation to another when it comes to church, but, but prayer is something that changes lives, and, and prayer is something, a way we get to communicate with you. We thank you that we're children of God, that you love us despite of us, and you chose us to follow you despite of you, and we thank you for that. We just pray that that, that message will like, just sit in our souls. That the message of, of 1 John, which says, hey, God loves you despite of you, that will sit within us and, and just convict us and change us. So we thank you for making us children of God, sons and daughters of God. That's such an amazing thing. Uh, we pray that we've been changed by your word. And we thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, a couple quick announcements real quick. I uh, just wanted to give you a little heads up for this week. Uh, as you walk out, there's study guides back there if anyone wants a study guide for this sermon. Uh, we will have Tuesday night class this week on Tuesday. We will have a Wednesday night class, and then we also have tween group on Wednesday night as well. And the last thing is, remember, if you bought, brought boxes or grabbed a box for Operation Christmas Child, bring them back on Sunday, lay them up here when you come in, and we'll pray over them next week. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, I'll see you all next week.